If you will turn in your Bibles to the 18th chapter of the book of 1 Kings as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you'll remember that we watched as Ahab came to power. And you'll remember it was said of Ahab that he did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all of the kings of Israel that had come before him. And you will recall how the Lord sent Elijah to Ahab to tell him that there was going to be a drought and that the drought would not stop until Elijah's word broke the drought. And you remember that after Elijah had delivered that message that the Lord told him to go and to run to the brook Cherith and, and there he would supply for him. And you remember that by faith he obeys and he just goes to the brook and, and you can imagine just a stream by the, uh, by the brook there and, uh, and all of a sudden the provision of the Lord. Ravens would bring him, it said, meat and bread every single morning. So can you imagine that, the provision of the Lord showing up with these blackbirds bringing what you need and dropping it off? And, and then it said in every evening, they would bring meat and bread and give it to you. And so the birds were now supplying for God's prophet. And, and there he was in, in hiding. Meanwhile, Ahab, we're going to find out, he was very upset with Elijah, and he was searching for him every town, every village. He was sparing no expense uh, at trying to uncover exactly where he was and who knew where he was, and someone had to know where he was. Someone is feeding him and lodging him, and, uh, and so he's somewhere. And so he... He searched high and low across the whole country. But here the Lord had tucked him into this brook. And it says that he would then drink from the water and receive food and bread, meat and bread every single day. And here we see that, that Elijah is being built up as a man of God to be able to go and confront Ahab later on on Mount Carmel. But God always will build a man up into a mighty man of God before he will use him as a mighty man of God. And so here is Elijah. In the building up of Elijah, listen to this, was the humbling of Elijah. The humility now of having to depend on birds to bring you your food morning and night and day after day. And how absolutely helpless you had to feel. You didn't get a store of provision. There weren't cupboards now that you could go and, and there's just enough that's coming. And it's coming by appointment of these birds on a daily basis. And, and what must have gone through his heart as day after day these birds are bringing food to him. And the wonder of God, the provision of God, the safety of God, all of these lessons that God was beginning to prove to him in his heart day after day after day. But there was another problem. And while the ravens were bringing the meat and the bread, the brook kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the provision of water kept on drying up. God, I don't know if you're seeing this from up there, but this brook is getting mighty small. And then one day, there was no more water. Okay, God, now what? And the word of the Lord said, move. It's time to move on now. I'm going to take you to another place. I'm going to take you out of the country. I, I'm going to bring you now up to Zarephath, up in Sidon, and you're going to have provision there. No longer is the provision going to come from birds, but now the provision is going to come from a Gentile widow. So, I mean, here, here we see that, uh, that there's this poor widow 
that is a Gentile outside of the country and, and this is who you are to go to. And so you remember that he just comes into the town and who meets him but a widow is there and she's collecting sticks and he asks her for a drink of water and, and she goes to get him a drink of water and he says, and if you could bring me a, a cake of bread also. And she said that the, the reason she is gathering sticks is because she only has a handful of of flour and a little tiny bit of oil left and just enough to make a cake for her and her son and then they're going to die. That's So they were completely out of provision. This was their last meal that they were going to have and then they were ready to starve to death after that. And so Elijah says to her, okay, uh, just make one for me first and then go ahead with your plan to make your own cake after that and to eat from it. And, uh, and you remember that, that we talked about the first fruits to God, that God gets the first part and then we receive the rest from that and putting God first. And so here was this widow and she's just got this little tiny bit that's left in this that this holy man, this Jew, has come and asked her for it. But by faith, she obeys. She trusts. And she cooks for him. And he says to her that, uh, that that bin of flour is not going to run out. Provision is not going to run out until the drought ends, until rain falls down. And it says, and for many days now, they continued to make their cakes and she continued to take care of the prophet and he continued to dwell there. And then you'll remember that one day that her son got ill and died. And now she comes to, uh, to Elijah and says, look at the calamity that has befallen me. I've been helping you and, and now are my sins remembered? Or are, am I being punished because, because I'm in your proximity now? God looks at you and he sees me and he sees my sin and now he's brought judgment uh, upon me. You've brought calamity to my house. And you remember that Elijah now faces another test of faith here. And he comes and carries the lifeless body of this boy up onto his bedroom, places him on Elijah's bed where he's been lodging. And then you remember that he falls down on the boy and then prays over him. And three times he prays over him. Prays the first time, nothing happens. Praise the second time, nothing happens. Praise the third time, and suddenly now we see life returns to this young man. And he presents him back to the widow now. Elijah has been being tested in the wilderness. He's been being tested in his trials. He has been having to depend completely upon God. And now he trusts God. And he is ready to be used mightily by the Lord. The drought has been in effect for three and a half years. There is a tremendous famine that is upon the land. And we're going to pick it up now where King Ahab is searching for any type of, uh, of provision that he can find for his own livestock so that his own livestock does not perish. And they're going to run into Elijah as they are looking for this provision. And we are going to see that there is going to be one of those moments where it is a choose this day who you are going to serve. Remember that the great sin of Ahab is that he brought the worship of Baal because of Jezebel, his wicked wife. And queen. He had introduced the worship of Baal into the land, built altars uh, for Baal, and now leading the people into the worship of Baal. And so idolatry had entered into the land. And once again, what was the idolatry? I want you to know there's a difference between idolatry or atheism. 
You know, they hadn't taken and kicked God out. They hadn't stopped worshiping the true and the living God. They just added additional worship to the worship of God. And so there was now this pluralism that had entered into the land where God said that I am the one, the true, and the living God, and you're to have no other gods before me. They now were having multiple different gods, Asterisk and Baal and all the gods of the pagans that had had the land prior to the Israelites and coming and taking the land. And now we see that there is going to be a call by God to return back to him. And he's going to use the voice of a mighty prophet, Elijah now, who has been being built up through these destitute and hard times. Certainly these last three and a half years, Elijah wouldn't say that he was being built up into a mighty man of God. He probably felt more like, why are you picking on me, God? I I did what you wanted me to do, and next thing I know, I'm having to camp outside in the wilderness for I don't even know how long, and then then I had to go and live out of the country in in a widow's house, and feeling like he has had great hardship in his life and great difficulty in his life. And many times when God is preparing us and doing the work in our own hearts, in our own lives, it can feel like we're being penalized for following God. It can feel like, you know, have you forgotten about me? Why is this so difficult? If I'm following you, and if I'm trusting you, shouldn't I be being blessed? Shouldn't things be easy? Shouldn't I get what I want when I'm doing what you want? But we see God is preparing the character of a person before he uses them. God cares about your character. And he is working on your character. He's working on my character. And he uses the hard times and the afflictions and the leanness of the soul to strip away us from ourselves so that we become wholly devoted to him and to what he desires to accomplish in our lives. And so oftentimes the preparation years, they feel lean and hard, but in hindsight, they become the necessary foundation for the work that God is doing in your life and through your life. Let's pick it up here in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. And so here we see that it was during the third year of Elijah's stay in Zarephath that God now commands Elijah to present himself before Ahab. Now, God had once before told him to go present himself before Ahab. And so this is the second time that he is going to come and and present himself to Ahab. But this time he says, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So the promise of God now is that the drought is over and that God is going to bring rain. So there is going to be relief to the famine, relief to the difficulty and to the circumstances circumstances that everybody is struggling in. And so this is a good word that comes to uh, Elijah now. Notice that he says, and go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Notice that it's not Baal that's going to send rain on the earth. Now remember that Baal was the god of fertility and, uh, and the rain was part of the crops that they were, you know, worshiping. And, and so Baal was going to help them to be prosperous. And so 
In a very real sense, Baal represents mammon and carnality and the, and the things of the flesh. And so here they wanted the blessing of God, but then they also wanted all of the blessings of the flesh at the same time. And so God was, uh, Baal was considered to be the God of rain, but here they were worshiping the God of rain. And what was happening? They had no rain. They had a drought uh, and they had no crops whatsoever. And now God said, I'm the one that's going to bring the rain so that you might know that I am the true and the living God. And there is no other God. And so Elijah, verse 2, went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe, a severe famine in, in Samaria. Now, I want you to know, here is an absolute truth. We will never prosper when we are disobedient to God. Your life is never going to prosper when you're being disobedient to God, and you think that you're being disobedient because you're going to grab a blessing in your disobedience and then add it to the blessings that you have for your obedience over here, your life, you are always, always, always going to enter into famine of your soul in your life when you are disobedient to God. And so as the nation became disobedient to God, not prosperity, but instead what happened? Famine is what it ended up happening. And so they ended up leaving the true worship of God. They embraced sin in their life so that they might have riches, but instead what they got was poverty. When you chase after and you are disobedient to God, then you certainly are going to experience an impoverished life. Verse 3, and Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and for it was for so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. And so we see that Obadiah feared God greatly. And so he was a, a believer in, in the true and the living God. And he was worshiping the true and the living God. But he was in a wicked environment that was around him. But even though he was in a wicked environment, he still was doing the right thing. And when persecution came against God's anointed, Obadiah risked his own life to be able to rescue and to bring provision for those who were being persecuted. In verse 5 it says, And Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. They were starting to get so thin and so weak that, uh, that they either needed some sustenance or they were going to have to slaughter them uh, in that condition. And so they didn't want to, verse 6, so they divided the land between them to explore it. And Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. In verse 7, now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him. And he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your master, Elijah is here. So Obadiah is out searching the springs to see if any of them have any water whatsoever. And suddenly he comes across Elijah and he recognizes Elijah. And, and he bows respectfully to God's prophet, and now he calls out to them, is that you, my Lord Elijah? And he, he identifies himself, and he tells them to go inform Ahab that he was back and that he wanted an audience now with the king. In verse 9, though, we see Elijah's response to Elijah's directive here. He says, and so he said, how have I sinned that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? And as the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hire you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. So Obadiah protests now that, uh, that if he goes and tells Ahab that he found Elijah, that this is a dangerous mission that could end up costing him his life. He says, why are you mad at me? Why, what have I done that you now are giving me this dangerous assignment to go to Ahab and tell him that he found Elijah? 
in verse 11, it says, and now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you, that the spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. And so uh, here we see that, that Obadiah's great fear is that the minute that he goes to tell Ahab Elijah is there, that, that God is going to tell Elijah to move, and he's going to move by the leading of the Spirit. And when Ahab comes back, <laughs> there's not going to be an Elijah there, and then he's going to end up being in trouble. Now, what I do love about this is Obadiah's faith in the fact that the prophet of God will be led by God. That if God tells him to move, that he's going to go ahead and move. And, and we see the surrender of the prophet of God, of the man of God, to the will of God in his life. If God tells him to move, he's going to move. I want you to know as believers, we need to have that same sort of surrender, absolute surrender to the will of God in our life that we are not to hold on to our plans tightly, but to hold on to our plans very, very loosely. We're not our own, and we've been bought at a price. And what we are seeking is the will of God in our life. And what we are seeking is to be obedient to God's will and to go wherever he sends us and to do whatever he would have us to do. And so we see in the scriptures in James chapter 4, it says, now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if kills, we shall live and do this or do that. That everything is subject to the will of God in your life. And so here is the question. Are you surrendered to the will of God in your life? Here we see that Obadiah is concerned that Elijah is so surrendered to the will of the Lord that the spirit is going to tell him to move. And he's going to end up moving when he goes and gets the king and he comes back and it's going to cost him his life. And so we see here that in verse 13, he now pleads with him not to him on this mission that he sees as dangerous because he says that, you know, look at the things that I've done and the blessings that, that I've been used for. Is my life really going to end with this calamity? Verse 13, was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of and how I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. He will kill me. <laughs> so this guy, Obadiah, is freaking out uh, over Elijah's instruction. Tell Ahab that he's here and that he wants an audience with them. But in verse 15, it says, Then Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. He said, I am a servant. I am the servant of God. And I stand before him. What does that mean? When a servant stands before his master, it means that he stands ready to do whatever the master instructs him to. He is standing at the ready. It means direct me. Direct me. And this now is to be our posture before God. Direct me. What would you have me to do? How would you have me to live? You remember that Jesus said there in the Garden of Gethsemane when he didn't want to, to go through when the, the, the sorrow that was ahead of him was painful for him to look at and that was the way that the Lord was leading him. Even Jesus said, nevertheless though, not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. And so here we see that Elijah is surrendered, he's yielded, and he's emptied. But, but how was he able to come to such a place? 
You see, he was able to come to such a place because of the time that he spent next to the brook Cherith, because of the time that he spent in Zeth, there with the widow in Zion. So to be able to be prepared in your life for that type of dependence, that type of surrender, that type of commitment to the Lord. This is what God desires. And so Elijah assured that he will surely remain there to meet Ahab. Why? Because God has already directed him to go and to meet Ahab. He knows that he's not going to be called away by the Spirit. Why? Because he's already being led by the Spirit to be there to go and to meet Ahab. So he's not performing his own will. He is already in the perfect will of God and underneath the Lord's direction. And so Obadiah now is going to go and to deliver the message. Verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet to Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And then it happened when Ahab, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? <laughs> oh, Aaron, here we see that, uh, that Ahab now charges Elijah as the one who is the troubler. He's the one that has brought this problem. You're the troubler of Israel. But it wasn't the prophet that had troubled the people the land. Rather, it was their own sin. It was the sin of the people now that had brought the trouble upon them. You remember when Joshua had entered into the land and the very first city that he came to was Jericho. And you remember that, uh, that this was now a city that was uh, to be consecrated as a burnt offering to the Lord in the, uh, in the land now, sort of a first fruit to the Lord. And they were not to partake any of the spoils. A burnt offering you weren't to partake of. A fellowship offering, you get a portion and the Lord gets a portion and you fellowship with the Lord. But a burnt offering is all the lords. And so they were told that when they come into Jericho that they are to destroy it completely and are not to take any of the spoils for themselves whatsoever. And this is a burnt offering unto the Lord. But you remember that when Achan gets into the city and, and he sees there is this beautiful Babylonian garment and, and next and there's a hundred or 200 shekels of silver and, and then next to that 50 shekels of gold and so here is this garment I mean it would be a waste wouldn't it to destroy a Giorgio Armani suit uh, for no reason you know whatsoever it fits perfect look at it, it's my size and, and all and he ends up you remember he ends up coveting it and he takes it back to his tent and he ends up burying and hiding it in his tent. No one is going to know that, uh, that he did this. And you remember that after the victory at Jericho, the route that they had, that the next stop, the next battle that they had was this small town called Ai. Just <laughs> small. And so Joshua just sends some troops up there. It's an it's a easy victory for them. But instead of them getting a victory, they get routed. And Joshua falls on his face before the Lord and he says, what is going on? What is going on that we would get routed? And the Lord says, there's sin in the camp. There is sin in the camp. There's a troubler of Israel that's in the camp. And so you remember that the Lord tells him to draw lots and he will identify who that troubler uh, is. And you remember that lot uh, is drawn and then he calls Achan, the lot falls on Achan and he says, you troubler, you have brought calamity on us. You've brought disaster upon us now. Come and confess your sin. And so he confesses his sin. But his sin had ended up bringing calamity there upon the nation. The sin of the people of worshiping the Baals and the Ashtros and going after the false god. They are the troublers uh, of uh, Israel. But instead Ahab calls out to Elijah. 
as being the, the troubler. And, and Elijah is going to correct uh, this charge, uh, verse 18. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. And in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Ahab had abandoned the Lord's commands in his law and had instead incorporated the worship of the Baals. And so we see here verse 19. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so the accusation here by Ahab is that is the religious people that are ruining the nation. (laughs) And I want you to know that, that the accusation with us is that the religious people are trying to destroy our country. And that they need to, our country is saying that we need to get out of the schools and we need to get religion away from the people, that this is the great problem that we have. And so the, the charge that we are the troublers of, uh, of the nation and that our God's name is offensive to everybody and we need to stop offending people in our country. And, uh, and so these are the very same accusations. The Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. Amen. It was happening all the way back in, in Ahab's day. What was the problem? Was that the nation that had at one time one nation under God had now become pluralistic. And they had said that the problem is that we're too narrow and we need to broaden things up. And that as that happened, uh, then sin came into the land and then there was judgment that was coming upon the land. So we see that there is a a parallel between where our country is and where the nation of Israel was at this point in time. And so the blame for the hardship is coming upon uh, those who are seeking to walk in God's ways and to God. And so Elijah now calls to gather all of the prophets and to meet them up on Mount Carmel. And so Ahab, verse 20, sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. We see here that what is Elijah saying? Elijah is saying, make a decision. Who is the true and the living God? And whoever the true and the living God is, then worship him. But don't falter between two opinions. You remember that Jesus In his earthly ministry, he declared that you cannot serve two masters. He says, you will either hate the one and love the other, or you will despise the one and reject the other. But you cannot serve, and listen to what he said, God and mammon. You cannot serve God and wealth. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were serving God, and then they were also serving wealth. They were chasing after the idolatry of riches. That's why they were worshiping Baal. And they were now faltering between these two opinions. And in the end, who did they go chasing after? The money. They chased after. First they started worshiping both, but he says, you can't worship both. One of them is going to win out over time when you do that. And what had happened is that Baal was winning out in the heart of the 
people. And they now were chasing after their careers. They were chasing after the shekel. They were chasing after the lifestyle. They were chasing after the possessions and the clothes and the houses and the nice sports donkeys that they were driving and uh, all of the all of the, the the cool things of their day that now gave them status and made them feel successful and so they started to compete with the Joneses uh, and they redefined success no longer was it a broken contrite heart and holy reverence before God and living in the fullness and the fatness and the thickness of relationship with God but instead it was about prosperity and so the Baals the worship of Baal became more and more common and more and more popular. And now Elijah is calling them on the carpet and saying, who is God? Who are we as a people? Who are you as an individual? Where is your heart? You have a defiant heart. Is the culture pulling you away from God? Are you making the compromises in the world and your relationship with God so that you can continue to feel accepted by the standards of the world? Or are you 100% content in who you are in Christ? And who you are in Christ. And in the richness and the fatness of your intimacy with the Lord and the blessings that that relationship with the Lord gives to you that the world can't understand, can't figure out, and can't provide all the money on Wall Street. And so choose. Who are you, Israel? Choose. Who are you, America? Where is your soul? Who are you as a people? Choose said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men, and therefore let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And so all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Yes and amen. This is going to be a showdown of the gods here. This is a throwdown between God and Baal right now in front of the people with all of the people gathered together. We are going to prepare two sacrifices and then see which one is going to have fire called down from heaven to consume it. I would want to be at this. Uh, right uh, here. And so now this three and a half year drought and famine, uh, this had been a great embarrassment to the worshipers of Baal, but now they were going to be given an opportunity to be able to right this wrong and to have it. And so they, they thought that it seemed like a good opportunity to vindicate their God, and they readily agreed to it. Verse 25, now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of but put no fire under it. And so they have hundreds of priests and prophets there to be able to prepare the bull and slaughter it and to get the altar and the wood and all of that. And Elijah's saying, I'm just one guy. So you go ahead and get, get yourselves and you get a head start on me and, uh, and go ahead. And verse 26, it says, so they took the bull, which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning, even till noon saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. I'm not going to leap around uh, to illustrate that, but you can imagine that. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them. 
and said, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he is busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. They say, I think he overslept. Just cry louder. Uh, and so he's goading them on. He's egging them on with this. And, uh, and so, you know, when it says that he, he is busy, uh, we see here that, that that means that he's busy in the restroom uh, is what that word actually is referencing uh, there. Um, and so, so Elijah is really jabbing at these prophets uh, here. With this now, remember that you know he's saying maybe he's he he's sleeping. Remember the psalmist says that the Lord of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. That God's attention is on us 24-7. That he loves you and you are precious to him. You are the apple of his eye. And while you sleep, he watches you sleep every single night. How amazing is that? That he sees you're ever stirring. He sees you're ever... <laughs> You're shifting and you're positioning when you're tussling and he's watching over you every second, every second. He cares that much about you. He never takes his eye off you. That's how much God loves you. Amazing. And so they cried aloud, verse 28, and cut themselves uh, as was their custom with knives and until the blood uh, gushed uh, out of them. I am so glad that we don't have to cut ourselves to show God how much we love him and gush with blood uh, uh, to show him that we are authentic. But that's what they uh, did with Baal. And when midday was passed, they prophesied the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. And so six hours of chanting for lightning and doing all the, you know, the chants, the lightning chants and, and rain and lightning times would come to Mount Carmel and the range that was near the Mediterranean Sea. And then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And so all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. It shows you the condition of the altar of the Lord, that it needed to be repaired, that it was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. And then built an altar in the name of the Lord. And this is just a reminder to us that that some of us may need to do some repairs on the altar in our life. That maybe there was a season or a time when, when you were regularly offering sacrifices of worship and praise to the Lord. But now maybe, maybe you found yourself getting too busy, too pressed in, and don't have the time any longer that you once did. Oh, there's various different reasons and various different ways that our altars can fall into disrepair. But if that's the case today, then the Lord would have you to just take the stones and, and reset them again. His desire is that your altar would be rebuilt and that your worship once again would emanate from your heart the fullness of joy. And so he rebuilds the altar, verse 32. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two sayas of seed. That's in quartz. And, and he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So there is a, a stream at the bottom of Mount Carmel, and so they and they lug it up and they pour it now onto the sacrifice. And, and so verse 34, then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. 
And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. So water from the spring is brought up and just poured on and poured on and poured on until it is soaked, and now the very trench itself is filled up. And it came to the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. See, Elijah acknowledged that God was the one that was behind all of these actions, that he was the one that was behind this demonstration as to who is God. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. You see, what was the whole point of this demonstration? Was to win their hearts back to the Lord again. You see, whenever we start to stray, whenever we start to stumble, God's desire is to draw you back again. We have short attention spans and suddenly, you know, baubles and things can just take our attention away from the Lord. And when our attention starts to get taken away from the Lord, do you know what he does? Draw us back again to draw us back to him. That you have turned their hearts back to you again. In verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now, God's control of the rain was a direct attack on Baal's supposed power. And so he was the God of thunder and lightning and rain. And so God had shut up the rain and then he calls fire down from heaven. These are supposed to be the wheelhouse of Baal. And Elijah said to them, fits of Baal and do not let one of them escape. And so they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook in Kishon and he executed them there. And so we see that the people now rise up and they awake out of their stupor. They recognize that God has just met them, that has just demonstrated himself for them. And, and do you know what? In our lives, we can have those moments where God does minister to us and he meets us and he lets us know that, uh, that he is for us and with us. And we have those encounters. And, and suddenly, what is this? And then there is this repentance that takes place. There is this getting rid of the things that had distracted us. And there is this refocus and this purifying of our lives and our hearts and our relationship with him. Once again, God desires repentance from us, not being obedient to him. And then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. Now, previously, Elijah had predicted drought. But here now the prophet tells the king that there is going to be a, a, a heavy rain. And Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And so he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Visit Israel. One of the places that, uh, that we go uh, is to Mount Carmel. And you can stand on this platform, this lookout on the top of Mount Carmel, and you can see all the way to the Mediterranean. This is the supposed site of where, uh, of where this contest uh, actually took Seven times he is praying and he says, go look out to the Mediterranean. The, you can see in the distance. And, 
He says, there's nothing. He says, go again in verse 44. And then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. And so he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. So we see that he tells them that he told him to go eat. And while he's eating now, the, the storm starts to brew over the Mediterranean. And he says, tell Ahab to stop eating. He needs to get in this chariot and go because the rain is going to flood the roads and his chariot is not going to be able to transport. It does not get out now. And so Ahab rode away and he went to Jezreel. Uh, and we see that Jezreel was Ahab's winter capital. It was about halfway between Mount Carmel and, and Samaria. In verse 46, it says, The Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance uh, of Jezreel. And so we're going to see that now, Elijah is going to flee, having destroyed the prophets now, of Baal is it going to flee from Jezebel who now is going to be angry with this prophet and is going to chase him down and we're going to see Elijah now as he goes on a flight away from Jezebel this next time when we look at 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's uh, close our study here. And, and may the Lord just minister to, to each and every one of us that there would be a, a purity of heart. Mount Carmel says, strip away everything that has been added to your worship of God. It's not that we have turned away from God. It's that there's other things and issues that may have come into our hearts and into our lives that are keeping our heart from being right with God. And if there's anything in your life that's not right with God, that's preventing you from being clean and pure and right with God, tear it down. Ask God to tear it down in your life. Give you a holy passion for his will in your life and fully surrender to that will. Choose this day. Are you all in with the Lord? Or is it the Lord plus everything else that you think you want to make you happy? Or just the will of God in your life? Let's pray. Father, bless us and help us and minister to us, Lord. You created us. <laughs> you breathed into us. And you are seeking to turn our hearts to you. Lord, may our hearts be fully turned to you tonight. And Father, we thank you for your great love and how you meet us in our weakness and how patient you are with us. And Lord, continue to do those deep works in our hearts by the brooks of Cherith and, and Lord, and Zarephath of Sidon. And prepare us, Lord, for the Mount Carmels in our life, that we might be used by you to exalt you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.